Floods devastate the Midwest. How are the region's cultural resources affected? And what is the preservation community doing to aid in the recovery? Archaeology goes high tech. Find out about a workshop that puts the future of archaeology in the hands of participants. How safe are you on the internet? A web privacy expert explains how you can engage in the online world without becoming a victim. of Preservation Today. I'm Lane Lucky. And thanks for being with us today. I'm Vera Reyna. We're so glad you can join us. Our purpose here is to help keep you informed about what's happening in the world of heritage preservation. And you might recognize the format. It's similar to your 6 o'clock news, but with a web 2.0 twist. That's right. We're building a community based on ideas and common values, not on where you happen to live. And we're reporting information to you to make you think, not to shock you. But we also want you to become a part of our community. You can start by visiting our show notes site at preservationtoday.com. We'll have links to all the stories we're covering and opportunities to interact as well. But first, we'll start with our latest headlines. George Washington's boyhood home has been found. After a seven-year search in the excavation of three sites, archaeologists have confirmed that Ferry Farm in Fredericksburg, Virginia is the site of the president's childhood home. More than 500,000 artifacts from 11 time periods have been found, including wine bottles, silverware, and a clay pipe with a Masonic crest that is thought to have been actually belonged to Washington. The Washington Foundation said that the research would continue on Ferry Farm and search for other buildings and gardens on the property. The ultimate goal is to reconstruct the house Washington grew up in. In response to an unfunded mandate passed by the state legislature, the Foundation for Historical Louisiana has hired the firm RMJM Hiller to complete an independent evaluation of Charity Hospital in New Orleans. The firm is charged with producing a practical concept for reusing the hospital as a modern health care facility. RMJM's report should play a major role in decisions concerning the construction of new hospitals in the area. Charity Hospital is the most prominent example of Art Deco architecture in New Orleans and has a history that goes back more than 250 years. LSU Health Sciences Center closed the hospital in September 2005 after Hurricane Katrina. At the time, it was the second oldest continuing public hospital in the United States and it was the second largest hospital in the nation. RMJM is scheduled to release its report on August 21st. The Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation has acquired 189 acres of one of the nation's most endangered battlefields. The acquisition will protect Cedar Creek Battlefield from the controversial expansion of a nearby limestone quarry. More than 47,000 soldiers fought the last major Civil War battle in the Shenandoah Valley. The field covers more than 6,200 acres. Only 1,092 acres has been protected. Up next, we'll explore how the heritage groups are coming together to save our nation's cultural treasures in flood-ravaged Iowa. The record-breaking floods across the Midwest have not only affected the lives and livelihoods of countless people, they've also destroyed or damaged numerous cultural institutions, public buildings, rural landscapes, and historic districts. In response, the Midwest Office of the National Trust for Historic Preservation has convened an Iowa Flood Response Coalition to help Midwesterners cope with the damage by providing resources, technical assistance, and support to affected areas. One of these partners is Bruce Moore, a property owned by the Trust in Cedar Rapids. The historic site was the city's only cultural institution spared by any major damage. It has since become a hub for recovery efforts there. Officials at Bruce Moore say numerous sites were completely submerged by the flooding waters. Among the sites receiving the most damage were the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library and the African American Museum in Cedar Rapids, each of which took on at least 15 feet of water. 
The flood is the worst ever recorded in Cedar Rapids, with the Cedar River swelling to 31.9 feet after receiving 27 inches of rain in the first 12 days of June. Silos and Smokestacks National Heritage Area is also a partner in the Recovery Coalition. Officials there report widespread damage over the Heritage Area's 37-county region in northeast Iowa. Don Short, executive director of the Heritage Area, says he is optimistic about the recovery operations that are underway. All of our 37 counties in northeast Iowa, which makes up our national heritage area, has been declared a presidential disaster area. I'm standing beside the Cedar River that flooded out of its banks almost three weeks ago, destroying a lot of the area, just totally flooded it. Our 106 partner sites, we have over a third of them that have received some type of damage, some of them to the point where it could be very difficult for them to rebuild. As far as the rebuilding process, this is a very tight-knit community. They work hard, they work well together. The sandbagging efforts, you can see the sandbags behind me here at the Ice House Museum, just suffered a lot of damage. The people really came together and helped one another overcome the disaster of this flood. And as far as our rebuilding efforts, it's gonna take some time, no doubt about it. The American Institute for Conservation is among the organizations getting their hands dirty in the rescue effort. The group's collection emergency response team, also known as CERT, has its first team in place and will deploy additional teams by request of the area's cultural institutions. According to Errol Wentworth, AIC Executive Director, AIC has shipped its first order of supplies for eventual distribution at Bruce Moore. CERT team members are assessing affected sites to determine their needs and order appropriate supplies. In related news, AIC announced that it has hired Amy Primo as its CERT coordinator. In her new role, Primo will mobilize a group of 60 specially trained conservators and allied professionals for emergency response situations. We'll be following the recovery efforts in Iowa over the next few months. We'll also hear from some of the personal stories of the recovery and discovery efforts and also lessons of those in heritage preservation. We're also learning more as a result on the situation. In the meantime, you can find a list of resources for dealing with the floods and other disasters by visiting our website at present ServationToday.com. Here's a look at your heritage news from around the world. The ninth annual Vast International Symposium on vir Virtual Reality, Archaeology, and Cultural Heritage will take place in Portugal this December. Conference organizers view the symposium as a dialogue on the present and future of archaeology in the 21st century. The sessions, papers, tutorials, and workshops will explore the wealth of opinions and expertise on this topic, ranging from nuts and bolts, practical information on geographical information systems, to producing nonlinear narratives and multivocal visualizations of the past. These include social media technologies like Second Life. Russia is losing some of its most famous architectural treasures. Only 1,800 gingerbread houses remain as the country struggles to balance preservation with the demands of de development. In Tomsk, Russia, $3 million from the city treasury is being used to restore these buildings in an effort to demonstrate both the artistic and financial value in renovating historic structures. Gingerbread houses were once a prized way to display intricate wooden designs. The city hopes the restoration project creates a fairy tale historic district that will lure tourists to visit. Secretary of the Interior Dirk Kempthorne recently announced the award of more than $165,000 to fund research projects that use technology to advance preservation. Four projects were funded as a part of a grants program administered by the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. The National Trust for Historic Preservation will receive a $50,000 award as part of a three-phase project that evaluates the performance of historic wood windows. The foundation of the American Institute for Conservation was granted $23,000 to port its extensive conservation catalog into an online wiki format. Nearly $50,000 will go to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln to study the use of fiber-reinforced mortars, including sustainable organic fibers, for masonry rehabilitation. And finally, Tulane University will receive more than $42,000 to begin developing an analytical database for a prehistoric material known as CHERT. Since its establishment in 1994 as a research arm of the National Park Service, 
The NCPTT has awarded more than $6 million for preservation technology research. And up next, we'll have a member of the NCPTT in the studio to talk more about the grants program, including a brand new call for proposals. Joining us in the studio today is David Morgan with the Archaeology and Collections Program at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. David, thanks for being with us today. We just heard about the new grant awards and it sounds like some important research. What do you guys look for in a new proposal? Uh, successful proposals coming into us, we, we generally look for several things. One is that they have to have a, a demonstrated national need. So a lot of projects tend to be very local in what they do which is fine, but we have to make sure that other places around the country can take the ideas that are being developed at a very local area and apply them nationally. So we look for things that are national in scope. We also look for things that are innovative. We're trying to look for ways in which we can advance preservation technology. So we don't tend to fund proposals that have established technology, traditional technology, unless they're doing new applications with those, doing something that's innovative. So we try to be cutting edge. We try and push the envelope forward and be associated with some of the research going on in the country that's creating new frontiers. What are some examples of some projects you've funded in the past? We've funded quite a few projects in the past and some of those in archaeology and collections that have been successful and are going on now include one that's using lasers to identify the shells in all kinds of shell-tempered artifacts that are found in museums around the country so that we can determine where they came from without having to do any sort of destructive analyses. We have other projects that are using uh, satellite platforms to be able to survey large expanses of ground to identify as yet undiscovered archaeological sites so that federal agencies and state agencies and other people can monitor the archaeological resources that they're responsible for and the list goes on, we have quite a few. Right, it sounds like some really innovative ideas. How does someone go about applying for a grant? It's actually really easy. All they need to do is come to our website and we have an online application process and all they need to do is come on and fill that out by October 15th and send it in. We also try to offer them an opportunity to get some staff feedback. So if they come online, they can write a pre-proposal as we're calling it by October 1st to get some technical feedback from the staff and make sure that they're in line with what our mission is. I understand you're planning a workshop this fall in San Francisco uh, called a Prospection in Depth. Tell us more about that. Sure, we're going to, for about four days, we're going to be putting on this workshop that focuses on geophysics technologies. And what these are is really a combination of geology and physics. It's a way of looking below the ground without having to do destructive um, excavation in order to find out what's below the surface of the earth. This is something that's becoming very popular in archaeology today because it helps you plan better where you are going to do excavations. Archaeology is one of those strange sciences in that we're one of the few that actually kill off our informants in the process of doing what we do. So between the 16th and 20th of September we're going to bring together about five instructors to teach about 30 people what's the latest technology for ground truthing and geophysical prospection. Who will benefit from this workshop? Really professional archaeologists will across all sectors. There's, there are quite a few courses available for students in geophysics because of course this is a direction that our discipline is rapidly heading. And so undergraduates and graduate students can get training, but for those who have already gone on in the field and are actually out there doing the job, there are very few opportunities for them to get the kind of professional development training that this offers. So really archaeologists, cultural resource managers, people who have to deal with archaeological resources or those who go out and do this kind of work. So how is this training new or different from others? Well as I say there's there's not many to choose from to begin with but most of those that are already out there focus on mostly the mechanics of how the machines operate and sort of how you set them up how you run them, how you collect data, and how you bring it in, how you post-process it. Um, they're very good in that they offer very hands-on training, but they usually end there. 
they're usually doing these sorts of projects at genuine, authentic archaeological sites. So the idea that the, is that the data that you're gathering is legitimate archaeological data, but, but it stops there. So what we're doing that's sort of new and different is we're offering people the opportunity to see what it was that those instruments detected below ground so that they can add an interpretive focus to what it is that they're doing. So we go a little bit beyond what's traditional in that we let people begin learning how to truly interpret some of what are called anomalies in the profession. So how did this idea of prospection and depth come about? It was really just a serendipitous opportunity. I had a grant from the National Endowment of, uh, for the Humanities to do some archaeological research in Louisiana. And we were planning on incorporating some geophysical techniques into it. And I realized at that time that we had a rare opportunity to let participants see what was actually below the ground. Usually you get something below the ground and you have to kind of guess and speculate on what it is. We think this is a fire hearth or a storage pit or a wall, but you never really know. And since we were going to be doing the excavating anyway as part of a research agenda, it was a perfect opportunity to show people what was there. All right. Thank you, David. This sounds like some really great new opportunities. And if you want to learn more about the grants and training programs at the NCPTT, visit our show notes site, preservationtoday.com. As we mentioned in our opening, one of our goals here is to help inspire connections to heritage values through new media. So during each episode, we'll introduce you to the internet sites and tools that can help you make those connections or inspire connections of your own. So here to introduce a segment we're calling The Blog Roll is Jeff Gewing, producer of Preservation Today and a self-professed social media addict. Hi Jeff. Hi Farah. So what is interesting out there in cyberspace? For our first netcast, I wanted to start with one of my favorite blogs on heritage issues, and that's Museum 2.0. The blogger's name is Nina Simon, and she started the site to explore how museums can apply social media principles to become more engaging, community-based, and vital to society. I offer my congratulations because she lives up to that ideal in spades with content that's insightful, interactive, and media-rich. In other words, it's very, very 2.0. I spoke with Nina Simon on iChat recently, and here's what she had to say about museum management and curating a second life in the blogosphere. Well, I think that in late 2006, there were a lot of museum folks who started to be interested in this idea of what is the impact of Web 2.0, of wikis and of YouTube and all these things on cultural institutions. But a lot of the people who were asking those questions were not people who were in a position to really be technically embedded in what was going on in that world. Right. And I was somebody who, because of uh, the people who I was around in my peer group and also because my husband runs a web technology company, mm -hmm. I was heavily involved with people who were really on the fringe doing some pretty crazy stuff, you know, the first ones to Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so I felt like I was in this position to learn more about it and to maybe do some demystifying about um, what all this stuff is and how it can really apply to our missions. Because I think that one of the problems is that we look at this new technology and we say, okay, you know, this thing will slice penguins. And then we say, great, everybody needs this. But then, of course, you know, nobody needs a thing that slices penguins. Right. And uh, it's certainly not, you know, zoos and aquariums. But, um, <laughs> uh, but that there is this question of these are communication tools and they're being used in some really interesting ways. And how can we use what's going successfully about those and apply them to our missions, not just by using those same technologies like blogs and podcasts and all that kind of stuff, but also by looking at what's going on in the web and saying, how can we make a physical space that has the energy and the conversation around artifacts and content the same way we're seeing that happen right now so intensely on the web? Right. Now, several months ago, you had a post that uh, was very popular called... Um, how much time does Web 2.0 take? What would you have to, to say to someone like in heritage preservation, maybe mm -hmm. even in a museum setting that is just a little bit apprehensive to get into Web 2.0 because they're scared it's going to be a time sink? Sure. Well, I think that very reasonably our first 
approach to something new like this is to say we need to understand the whole landscape so we can form a strategy but i think that that's not the real appropriate starting point that can be very overwhelming i think the starting point is more try one thing that is uh, time uh, doesn't take up too much time and can work for you and so you know a great example is something like look just starting looking at blogs just becoming a spectator in that world you know joining LinkedIn or joining Facebook LinkedIn is a perfect example of one that I think a lot of people have joined LinkedIn and they're not really sure why right. but and they're sort of aggregating connections but there is this understanding that maybe someday I'm gonna need this network and every once in a while I do get a message from somebody who says you know hey I'm looking for somebody to fill this position or whatever it is through that network and I see it as having a very specific professional uh, function and so I feel comfortable with it in that function so I think that in the same way that a lot of museums when we first started having interactive exhibits imagine if instead of ever touching a push button or flipping a, a flip chart, um, you had started by saying, we want to understand every kind of interactive we could ever make before we make a decision about where we're going to go. And I think that instead what we know that we do is we go to museums, we experience interactives, we start getting a sense for I like this, I don't like that. And I think that in the same way we have to explore those new communication tools just by uh, engaging with them a little bit personally. Great. Now you're becoming very well known just in social media circles, like outside of heritage preservation. Uh, lots more folks linking to your post. You've been very insightful into the philosophies of social media. And um, another post that you had that was very popular was the hierarchy of participation. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of explain that concept for us? Yeah, I think that a lot of people look at what's going on on the web in terms of uh, people socializing on the web and they say, wow, there are these huge community spaces where all these people are talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that then from a cultural heritage uh, perspective, the analog would be to say, well, if we create the right kind of space, we'll get a lot of people talking to each other. And there's a more sophisticated problem here. And what I did with that hierarchy of participation was really analyze how did they get to that conversation space on the web. And it's sort of surprising, I call it me to we design, that they don't start by saying, hey, everybody get together and talk about books. They start by saying, oh, you, you like these books? Oh, this person likes those books, and this person likes some of the same books as you. And you start having these triangulating experiences from my very personal interest to some somebody else through a shared interest and then that compels me to talk to that person. So I think that what you see happening on the web in terms of these social interactions and relationships forming are really mediated through the technology and through content. So I'd love to see museums looking the same way at our content and saying, having ways for people to say, I love this painting, he loves this painting, now I'm more compelled to talk to that guy than I am to talk to any other visitors in the space at the same right. time. Right. She really does seem to be giving the Collections World a roadmap for adopting social media. Absolutely, and what's more impressive is her ability to communicate outside that audience. Now, most anyone could come to this blog and become immediately engaged with its content. And Nina Simon has a distinct voice, and Farah, I think it's one that all of us in heritage preservation should be listening to. All right, Jeff, thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. You bet. And to go online or not to go online with the research, that is the question faced by many in scientific and technical fields. Up next, I'll be talking with a blogger whose personal quest for justice led him to create one of the web's top resources for content and privacy issues. More than 15 years after it became popular, we're hearing more about the dangers of the World Wide Web than ever. How can you use the web to advance your research without compromising it and your identity in the bargain? Here to explore that question and a lot more is Jonathan Bailey. He's the creator of Plagiarism Today, one of the web's top resources for latest information on a lot of the issues we've been talking about, especially on privacy and protection. Jonathan, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So I understand you graduated with a degree in mass communications from the University of South Carolina. What brought you into the realm of working in the web world? 
Well, I've been posting my own work online. I've been an author for over 13 years. I actually started in high school posting my own works on the web. And about six years ago, I discovered people plagiarizing my work, pretending to be me, and generally speaking, ripping off my content, so to speak. And having that mass media background gave me a little bit of an advantage because I knew I had rights and I knew I had control over my work. But at that time, I was not sure how to enforce those rights and turn it into something that I could do practically myself. So I ended up sort of learning as I went, if you will, and exploring my options. And what can we do to protect our work, of course, with the new Web 2.0 paradigm? Well, it really depends upon what you mean by protect. If you want people to not use your work at all, that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. The web is very natural for copying and pasting. That's something that's kind of hard to avoid. But when most people talk about protecting, they're trying to avoid plagiarism. And the best thing you can do to protect your work is to track it and to monitor it. Um, Google and other search engines are great tools for monitoring your work. They work in reverse just as well as they do in forward, not only for, great, for, for finding content, but for finding your content on other sites. Just taking key phrases from your research sometimes can be a great way to see how other people have used your content and if, it, if they've used it in a way that you find acceptable. And there are folks out there who are cautious about engaging in some of the new web tools. Uh, how real is the danger? Is there anything that we can do to keep ourselves safe? Well, there's really two different types of identity theft people think of. The first is the more criminal type, where people are going to use their credit card information or their identity to get some kind of forged government documents. And the other is a more general, people are going to pretend to be me on the web. Um, the first type is unfortunately a very, very real danger. And the best thing you can do there is keep track of your personal information. Uh, information such as social security numbers, passport IDs, anything that could uniquely identify you or be used to get some kind of government documentation, you should not give out over the web unless there is an extreme urgent need to do so, unless it's over an, a very secure connection. A good example is you might be forced to give your social security number up if you're on a service that is going to pay you money and they need it for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. Likewise, credit card information, billing addresses, and so forth should also be kept as private as possible. But once again, if you're doing any online shopping, as almost everyone does these days, you're going to give that information out to at least some people. Just make sure it's people that you trust and make sure it's over a secure connection again. And as far as the general people are going to pretend to be me online, the best thing you could do is have a presence online, have an official resource, and have a place people can go to for real information about you. Some good advice. And a lot of social media content, including our netcast mm -hmm. here as well, distributed <laughs> under a Creative Commons license. How is Creative Commons different from traditional all rights reserved and copyright? and why is it needed? Well, Creative Commons is actually designed to solve a very interesting problem. With copyright, when you write something or produce something, including this netcast, the minute it's fixed into a tangible medium, it has copyright protection. And that prohibits other people from copying it, mashing it up, reusing it in any way. And if they want to do that, they have to get permission from the content creator. And that can be especially difficult on the web. It can be very hard to get in touch with people. It can be a very time-consuming process. And also, it's a bit of a hassle for the content creator if they're comfortable with it. They don't want millions of people asking them, hey, is this OK to do, when the answer is always yes. Mm -hmm. So Creative Commons solves this problem by giving blanket permission. There's no need to ask, no need for it to be given. You just use it for the purposes that are described in the license, and you go forth. That's all there is to it. And I understand you were at uh, an international conference on plagiarism. Uh, of course, this is a global, global problem. What did you learn? Well, it's very interesting. The Third International Plagiarism Conference was in Newcastle, England, and it was actually targeted largely at the academic society, specifically dealing with dishonesty both in terms of student plagiarism and research plagiarism in general. But it's fascinating because you can tell that there's more and more thought going into the web aspect of this and the more broad artistic aspect. People are starting to look at plagiarism as a more holistic problem. It's not just students cheating anymore. It's an ongoing issue on the web, and it's dealing with issues of authorship. You know, when can you say you wrote something versus it was written by millions of others of people? And also general issues of people wanting to protect their identity and their work on the web, but also still exploit the web and the advantages it brings. Well, obviously, uh, you're very knowledgeable about some of the problems we're discussing. Are you available to consult with individuals or businesses on these type of topics? I do offer consulting services to individuals and businesses. I tend to focus more on businesses, especially those that are producing products that are going to address these issues and help people track the content and help people sort of bring things into check and make sure others are following their licenses. 
but I do work with individuals as well in terms of developing strategies for the social web and in certain cases tracking down the people who are misusing their content and helping them, helping them enforce their licenses. Jonathan, thanks so much for your advice. You've given us a lot to think about. Thanks for being with us. And that's all for our first newscast. We hope you enjoyed it. You can support us by providing content for us to report. So start posting to those blogs, uploading your videos to YouTube, and getting your photos on Flickr or any social tool of your choice. Just use the tag Preservation Today, all one word, for your Preservation Heritage content. We'll snag it for our show notes blog and maybe even report about it in our next show. And remember, this production is distributed through a Creative Commons non-commercial, non-derivative license. That means it's free for you to take and distribute as you like. So you can also view it, download it, even share our video by visiting our show notes site, preservationtoday.com. Your heritage group can even request a free DVD of our program. That's if you're interested in having your local television or cable station air that program. Thanks so much for being with us. Until next time, we'll see you online.